From North Africa to the South Caucasus and the Black Sea, Turkey's immediate neighborhood has been consumed by countless conflicts and crises. What was the driving force behind Ankara's approach to the region and beyond over the past several years? I'll break it all down here on Straight Talk. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk, I'm Aisha Subarkash. Enterprising and humanitarian, that's how Turkey's foreign ministry describes the country's approach to the world. Situated in a dangerous neighborhood that has seen several conflicts break out in the past few years, Ankara has pushed the importance of ensuring peace and stability as the cornerstone to development. Turkey applied that formula both to its immediate neighborhood and beyond. But how successful was that type of engagement? Let's take a look at this report. And to further discuss the regional and global efforts of Turkish foreign policy, joining me now from Baku is Matthew Breiza. He is a former U.S. ambassador. From Trieste, Italy, Federico Donelli. He is an assistant professor at the University of Trieste who specializes on MENA region. And from Ankara, Murat Yeshitash. She is the director of security studies at the SETA Foundation. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So, Murat, let me begin with you. Could you talk to us about how Turkey's uh, foreign policy has evolved over the past few years? It's actually very difficult to answer this question because there are many developments that we have to mention in order to understand uh, Turkish foreign policy transformation. But when we look at the last uh, you know, couple of years, basically Turkish foreign policy activism that we can talk about, yes, Turkey became an important actor in the Middle East and North Africa uh, in terms of you know, uh, transforming its foreign policy in Syria, uh, Turkey is now is, is one of the important actors. Uh, uh, without Turkey's presence uh, in the diplomatic uh, process and other uh, military issues, it is not possible to talk about the uh, solution uh, in, in Syria. When we look at the Libya, for example, uh, which is one of the important uh, uh, strategic uh, issues for Turkey, 
And now we are talking about the uh, you know negotiation process in Libya. It became possible with the contribution of Turkey without Turkey's military assistance to the uh, you know internationally recognized government in Libya. It is not possible right now. It it, it I mean it is not possible to talk about the Berlin II process. Now, uh, in terms of the normalization process in the Middle East, the need uh, foreign policy idea of Turkey within the context of Middle, Middle East is normalization. Mm -hmm. Normalization with the Middle Eastern countries and normalization with the uh, Syria will be a uh, you know, important uh, factor uh, to understand uh, Turkey's uh, foreign policy in the Middle East. When it comes to the Russia, of course, it was another strategic development, especially to see how Turkish foreign policy transformed over the last decades, especially Turkey plays yes. a vital role, uh, especially for grain deal and other negotiation process in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine war. So, Matthew, I mean, how would you define the Turkey's uh, foreign policy? Like, would you brand it assertive, passive or balanced? I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, in a slogan, it's uh, make Turkey great again. It's uh, an articulation of Turkey's national interests and rights and responsibilities, by the way, uh, in a way that takes into account what Turkey's allies think, mm -hmm. but doesn't particularly worry if those NATO allies disagree. Uh, so it's a often transactional foreign policy. But I wouldn't use a label like aggressive or, or passive or anything like that. I, uh, Turkey's foreign policy is referred to in Washington as aggressive, but I think that's just a pejorative term that means Turkey isn't doing <laughs> exactly what Washington would like. Uh, and is upsetting some of the domestic uh, diaspora communities in the U.S. So, Federico, what can you tell us about, as uh, Murat uh, briefly mentioned, the state of relations between Turkey and several Gulf and Arab uh, countries? I mean, why do you think, what do you think has pushed the Middle Eastern countries to swiftly normalize their ties with Turkey and vice versa? There have been many different factors. If we consider the international context in general, we have seen how many change happened during the last two years, especially with the Ukraine war, but also with the increasing role of China in the region. So all these different factors uh, favor a normalization process among these players. And of course, this would be maybe the most important uh, uh, development in the upcoming years uh, and Turkey would like to play a role among them and at the same time would like to to play a constructive role among them. So Murat, do you see a new paradigm taking shape in the region and also what's the reason behind this rapid normalization uh, in the Middle East? Is this sustainable, you think? I think, yes, it is sustainable, but uh, still there are many uh, problems. First of all, there is a gap between the desired political solution and the fact on the ground. There are many problems uh, in which uh, regional actors cannot agree over the, you know, the comprehensive uh, solutions. Uh, for example, Syria, there is a gap between desired solution within the context of United Nations Security Council resolution and the fact on the ground. There mm -hmm. is, an, again, the huge gap in Libya, Yemen. So therefore, yes, normalization is an idea rather than based on the, the fact on the ground. Uh, there is a different situation on the ground. But there are drivers, I think, that we have to talk about, the drivers, why the regional countries you know, uh, support the normalization process. Because all the regional countries, one way or another, one reason or another, reason mm -hmm. reach their limits, uh, their material limits, political limits. On the other hand, the, all the regional uh, you know, countries are trying to recalibrate their relations with external entities and actors in which United States is the strategic one, because United States is also changing its priorities in the region, which ultimately paved the way the change of regional countries' perspectives towards the United States and, and, and the region. Yes. So therefore, yes, it is sustainable, but unfortunately, uh, there uh, must be a, you know, a new uh, you know, paradigm in terms of solving the gap uh, in, uh, on the ground. So I just want to play a statement by uh, Turkey's foreign minister where he talked about Ankara's foreign policy goals. Let's have a listen and then we'll continue to talk.
With our foreign policy, we didn't only solve problems concerning global security, food security and energy security, but also we kept our country away from disadvantages of this war. These are perceived as really important steps by the world. So what he was referring to was Turkey's role in securing a deal to allow for the export of Ukraine grain, uh, which had been blocked due to the uh, war in Ukraine, of course. So what kind of a role did Turkey play? I mean, how significant is this and what could derail this process? Well, it's hugely significant. If you look back at what grain prices were forecast to be uh, and the projections of potential famine, especially in Africa, uh, because of the loss of that grain to the market. And then you look at the situation today where grain prices are, are, have dropped precipitously and there is no fear of global famine. Uh, that's all due to the grain deal. Uh, that was a huge, a huge diplomatic victory achievement by Turkey. Uh, granted, in Washington, a lot of people are upset that Turkey has not joined the sanctions uh, against Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. But at the end of the day, there was needed to be uh, an honest broker who could bring that agreement together. What will block it is Russia. President Putin is trying to uh, hold uh, countries that depend on this grain, if you will, politically hostage as leverage to try to get uh, more Russian grain uh, and fertilizers and ammonia uh, onto global markets. Uh, Putin also, you know, he he always is negotiating for anything. You, you know, similarly to the way t Turkey is transactional, as I said, Turkey's uh, diplomacy has become transactional, is not so much based on ideology. And, and the same is true of Putin. Whereas in the U.S. and in, in uh, the rest of NATO, there's a strong ideological component in opposing Russia's invasion of Ukraine based on our professed beliefs in the sovereignty and independence of, of, of uh, nation states. So Matt, Federico, let's move to another uh, region, let's say North Africa. How has uh, Turkey's assistance to the internationally recognized government of uh, Libya changed the balance of power in the oil-rich African country a few years ago? Yeah, the role that Turkey has acquired in Libya is very important. As Matthew also suggests, Turkey has wanted to build this role as also as a mediator and in some way try to balancing act between other global players, especially NATO alliances and Russia, of course. And Libya is one of the, uh, we can say, the arena or the competition arena where Turkey is playing in the middle. That does not mean to be, uh, we can say, a problematic ally for United States and NATO. But I believe that there is a need of player within NATO that is able to uh, keep open dialogue also with Russia, even under the radar. And Turkey is playing very well in Libya nowadays. So well, for almost a decade, the uh, Libyan conflict has uh, festered and the European Union, as well as the United States, uh, mostly looked away. How has Turkey made use of this void? I think Turkey's contribution uh, to to bring to find a comprehensive solution is in uh, in Libya was very important and was very strategic. It was uh, even not possible to talk about the you know international diplomacy work in Libya if Turkey you know didn't support the internationally recognized government in Tripoli. Now uh, I think uh, the uh, momentum, the political solution momentum was lost unfortunately in Libya because of many reasons. The first one is the, the, the Russian you know, uh, war in Ukraine, and it, it changed the direction of the political mechanism on the ground. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the you know, Turkey-EU relations, I think that there are many opportunities in terms of bringing stability in Libya for European countries and, and Turkey. First of all, you know, uh, the Libya can bring stability and can, can you know, provide an important opportunity for, uh, for the developments in Northern Africa, because now we are, uh, you know, international community is concentrating on Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of, you know, as conflicts spillover affect the uh, the conflicts on the mm -hmm. ground in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Libya, I think, is a great opportunity to prevent all the conflicts spillover effect of the conflicts in this region. So therefore, Turkey's, Turkey's uh, collaboration with the European countries is strategically important in, in Libya. But there are some divergences amongst the European countries, including uh, France's uh, pr priorities is different compared to the other European Especially uh, Italy, uh, priorities. Especially Italy, yes. So, Matthew, yes, what, what kind of an approach does Turkey adopt when it comes uh, to armed conflicts? I mean, are they always in line 
with NATO principles? Well, it depends on how you interpret those NATO principles. Let's just look to two specific examples. Let's look to Northwest Syria and Idlib, and let's look at Libya, continue looking at Libya. Yes. Um, NATO principles are all about protecting civilians or, or you know, United Nations human rights principles. Uh, and when, after uh, Russia violated the agreement to protect the, the internally displaced persons in Idlib, uh, Turkey used force after its own troops were attacked. Turkey is the only country in NATO that has confronted Russia on the battlefield and won. It won twice. It won there in Idlib and then it won in Libya when it stopped al Haftar's militia from capturing Tripoli and thereby upheld international law. Uh, one could argue, uh, by supporting the UN-recognized government in Tripoli. So these are principles that NATO espouses, but it has not been willing to uphold across the board, as you already mentioned. Uh, France uh, is not on side uh, with, with Italy in the case of, of uh, Libya, mm -hmm. uh, but it was mm -hmm. the Turkish military, in the case drones, that were able to stop the Haftar uh, armed militia. So. Turkey is 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 really quite a bold country on the ground in asserting its rights and its interests, and I think largely to NATO's benefit. Well, it was a U.S.-led uh, NATO campaign over a decade ago in Libya, uh, which plunged the country in chaos. Let's remember that. So if we move forward, Federica, are we likely to see some positive spillover effects of Turkey's normalization um, with countries which have diverging interests in the Libyan conflict? Yeah, I guess so. I, I mean, for example, with Italy, of course, at the beginning of the Turkey intervention in Libya, there were many uh, critics also in Italy because, you know, there are some kind of divergent interests. Uh, but nowadays, it seems that the two countries would like to cooperate to stabilize Libya. And we have to consider also the effect and the implication of the nowadays uh, crisis in Sudan. And mm -hmm. this is definitely will push on Libya, and this is a very sensitive issue for Italian national security, migration flow, and especially for European Union. So I guess, yes, because they could cooperate better in the Mediterranean. So, um, Murat, I, how have devastating earthquakes that struck Turkey's uh, south in February have accelerated efforts to mend ties uh, with its neighbors, with which Turkey has been at odds for years, especially Egypt and Greece? I mean, how has this earthquake diplomacy yes. played out? Yeah, I mean, earthquake diplomacy is always important to, you know, normalize the relations between countries. Yes, in the uh, uh, past, uh, you know, 1999 uh, Marmara earthquake uh, actually facilitated to normalize the relationship between Turkey and Greece. Uh, yes, this time it is different because the geopolitical portfolio of Turkey is, is different compared to the 1999. Uh, Turkey is a different uh, context, is in the different context, and Greece is in the different context. But I believe, yes, it can facilitate to normalize the relationship, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, both countries can quickly solve the problem. Yes. Uh, you know, especially over the uh, the changing policies of Greece, over the Aegean Islands, its changing dynamics of the demilitarization policy, the Eastern Mediterranean energy geopolitics. So, therefore, I am optimistic in terms of the normalization uh, process between two countries, but I am not fully optimistic that both countries can easily solve their yes. structural mm -hmm. problems. When it comes to the Turkey Turkey Egypt relations. I think it is not only about the earthquake diplomacy. Both countries now realize that they should return a realistic and pragmatic policy understanding when it comes to the changing dynamics of regional politics in the, in the Middle East. So, Matthew, another region in which Turkey played a decisive role is the uh, South Caucasus. How has Ankara's military assistance to Baku, where you are now, um, during the Nagorno-Karabakh changed the balance of power in the region and what long-term implication will Azerbaijan's victory in Karabakh have on the region, you think? 
Yeah, well, first of all, and going back to Libya for one second, sure. to be clear, France pulled NATO along. The U.S. was reluctant to get involved. But then, of course, when NATO decided to get involved, then the U.S. was was really leading the effort, and I think disastrously. Uh, in the South Caucasus, I think Turkey's role is absolutely decisive. Let's be more specific. In Azerbaijan, um, it was the combination of Turkish drone technology and innovative tactics on the battlefield that integrated intelligence gathering by the drones uh, with artillery strikes that allowed Azerbaijan to make an unbelievably fast and decisive breakthrough and won the war uh, when, when Azerbaijan was able to capture the strategically important city of, of Shusha. Um, now we have Turkish peacekeepers on the ground. Okay, not as many as Russian peacekeepers, but these are NATO eyes and ears on the ground that can keep track of what the Russian peacekeepers are up to. And thank goodness the Russian peacekeepers have played a constructive role, unlike what they did in uh, Georgia, in South Ossetia, in Abkhazia, and in Moldova, in Transnistria where they actually fomented instability, they being the Russian troops. So Turkey's playing an important role right now. As for the future, uh, put it this way, Azerbaijan, for the first time in its history, can chart its own strategic destiny, having recovered its occupied territories, and now with massive infrastructure investments coming into place, and already in place when it comes to oil and gas pipelines uh, to Europe. There's much more of that to come. And if, if the Armenian prime minister, my prime minister can rein in his political opponents, which he's starting to do. I think a peace treaty is is not too far in the distant future. Both the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers were in Washington yesterday, hosted by the U.S. Secretary of State. The European Union has been very constructive as well. Uh, so I'm optimistic about positive change here in the South Caucasus, with Turkey playing an important role. So Federico, although Turkey maintains very close ties uh, to Russia, Ankara has also been vocal about the uh, maintaining the independence and territorial integrity of Central Asian countries across Central Asia, let's say, and many of these ex-Soviet states have also become closer to Turkey aftermath the uh, war in Ukraine. How will this trend affect the wider region, you think? I think that, again, this is, could be another area where Turkey could play an important role, a constructive role, and open a dialogue with Russia on multiple different things. Of course, Central Asian country have a strong tie with Turkey, especially related to cultural affinity. But we have to consider also that the Central Asia could be an important asset in the policy of Turkey to establish a sort of hub, energy hub, for European Union and European countries. Mm -hmm. So I believe that in the upcoming years, they will uh, strengthen the tie more and more. So Murat, another major foreign policy priority uh, for Ankara has been promoting and expanding regional groups. One of them is the organization of Turkic states. How important will group be in terms of regional security, trade and energy? Yes. It, I think it is important and it's a new strategic asset for Turkey, especially after these pandemics, because pandemics will probably impact more on international order. Mm -hmm. And after the Ukraine war, and we, we, we can see that Russia uh, has to change its strategic orientation in the Central Asia. And now Turkey is entering in this region with the uh, economic objective and the political objective. So this will, I think, uh, also impact the uh, international geopolitical competition over the over the region. So China is an important actor. Russia, we know that it's an important actor. And United States will, you know, maintain its uh, role in this region. Turkey now is entering as the new uh, strategic player in this region. And the regional countries and the members of this organization are really willingness to cooperate uh, uh, with Turkey. So therefore, it will I think, shape the future of uh, region's mm -hmm. geopolitics. So, Matthew, uh, Turkey says the middle corridor will see a six-fold increase year on year uh, due to the war in Ukraine because the northern corridor kind of uh, lost its importance. So what would a deeper connection between Turkey, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan mean for global supply chains? And what does this tell us about uh, Turkey's transportation policy in this regard? Well, uh, first of all, that uh, middle corridor is severely bottlenecked right now. So there needs to be a huge investment to mm. increase the capacity of the railways, of shipping, et cetera, through the corridor. But it will happen. 
Uh, the president of Kazakhstan, uh, Tokayev, has already directed his, his team to find a way to divert significant volumes of oil that used to be exported to the world via Russia uh, via this very middle corridor, which requires more oil tankers to be built inside the Caspian Sea region. But as this corridor expands, yeah, we're going to see a blossoming of trade and economic growth, and I hope right in the region. My, my dream is to see a series of organized industrial zones built from the shores of the Caspian Sea through Azerbaijan, uh, our, the recovered lands, Armenia and Turkey, all the way to the Black Sea. Such a regional approach could generate jobs, uh, economic growth, and really lay the long-term basis mm -hmm. for peace mm -hmm. between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And I know plenty of business people who are ready to invest in that. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk. I appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Sumerkes. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.